Hello on the full person, this is Anton, and today we're going to be discussing some of the new discoveries in regards to the idea of the first stars in the universe. Something that potentially solves some mysteries of these early stars, but also explains things that we still do not really understand very well. And more importantly, gives us an idea of what these early stars might have been like, and why we can seem to see them in most of the modern investigations using telescopes like the James Webb or the Hubble Space Telescope with all of these explanations coming from the relatively recent paper that used very complex computer simulations to potentially discover what some of these early stars were like. And spoiler alert, they might have been ginormous, much much bigger than anything we've ever imagined, and extremely different from anything in the modern universe. Approaching masses of tens and hundreds of thousands of solar masses, basically thousands of times bigger and more massive than any modern star. With the explanations from the recent paper providing some of the details of how all of this happened and why these stars were so different as well. But to try to understand the differences and why there are these differences, let's I guess start with something that we know already, the massive stars close to us. So for example here is Betelgeuse, this is a typical red giant, possibly about 16 to maybe 19 solar masses in mass, and just like so many other stars, its usual lifespan is a few million years at which point it goes supernova and releases a huge amount of gas, which actually also converts to heavier elements. With these heavier elements often referred to as metallic elements in astronomy, with more and more supernova creating a much more enriched environment, which eventually results in stars like our sun. For example, it's believed that approximately 40 to 50 different supernova happened in order to create the solar system with the elemental composition inside all of the planets and of course inside the sun itself. But in this case, this is a much younger star that was created billions of years after the beginning of the universe. But in the first billion years, the stars were very, very different. They contained a lot less metallic elements and were predominantly hydrogen and helium. Here's one example of an ultra metal poor star known as HE 0107-5240. The star is over 10 billion years old and was essentially created from these first few supernova during the first billion years of the existence of the universe. Here's another star, sometimes referred to as the Kafaus star, named after the original discoverer, and this one could be about 13 billion years old. But obviously something else had to create these stars, and that something else is sometimes referred to as the population 3 stars, or the hypothetical early stars, first stars, that existed everywhere in the universe and whose first explosions, first supernova, resulted in the formation of everything else. Now you might have heard this story before because I've talked about these in previous videos, but here it's really important to understand their origin. Unlike population 2 and population 1 stars like our sun, formed from various molecular gas that we usually see around the galaxy, the early population 3 stars were formed from something entirely different. It was also gas, but it was gas that was basically just hydrogen and helium, and it was also neutral and very likely behaved in very different ways compared to a modern molecular cloud where we usually expect stars to form. And so there's actually a really important feature that modern gas has that the ancient gas did not have. And that feature comes from these heavier metallic elements. Today, when various stars try to accrete and create larger and larger objects, they actually reach a kind of a limit. That limit is usually approximately 120 solar masses, because at this point the gas becomes hot enough that the actual heat inside the gas starts to expel everything around it. Or in other words, because of these heavier elements and because of various isotopes present inside the gas, once a certain mass is reached, it just becomes a little bit too hot to acquire any more mass. This is often referred to as the accretion limit. Although for baby stars, there's also something known as the Eddington limit, based on the light pressure created by the star itself. And so for really, really bright stars, as they become approximately 150 solar masses in mass, their light becomes so intense that once again the light pressure starts to push everything outwards and not allowing any more mass to come in. And both of these phenomena are the reason why we generally do not actually see a lot of massive stars in our own galaxy or even in galaxies nearby. For example, when studying this massive cluster known as the Arches Cluster, located really close to the central galaxy, but containing a lot of really really massive stars, the scientists confirmed that nothing here seems to exceed 150 solar masses, just like the theories predict. And even the iconic Tarantula Nebula in the nearby galaxy of Large Magellanic Cloud, with its really massive star cluster known as R136, 
was recently discovered to not contain anything over 150 solar masses either. And all of the other really massive stars discovered to date, like the record holders that are 250 solar masses, have then been discovered to actually be not one star, but usually several stars orbiting one another, with each individual star still being under that limit. But once again, these are modern stars. Stars created in the last few billions of years out of very different molecular clouds, clouds enriched in various metallic elements. But that ancient gas was very different. It was basically hydrogen and helium and did not produce as much heat or produce the same limitations when present in large amounts or in high densities. And hydrogen does not produce a lot of energy when condensed to the same amounts as a lot of other elements, which most likely allowed for the formation of much thicker, much denser clouds. But more importantly, clouds that could then suddenly collapse into extremely massive large objects if affected by something from the outside. And so the first few millions of years in the existence of the universe, we had a lot of this really, really thick hydrogen and helium gas containing really large clumps, but no stars just yet. With all this coalescing into larger and larger galaxies, very likely along the cosmic web. And so that's pretty much what the scientists plugged in into that recent simulation described in the paper in the description. They sort of recreated this early universe without early stars, with just hydrogen and helium gas interacting in various ways. But in this case, they also introduced a few more things. First of all, they allowed the simulation to run much, much longer than before. And second of all, they introduced something they refer to as the cold accretion, or really fast moving wind coming from outside of the galaxy that would suddenly crash into the galaxy causing a sudden burst in star formation, with all of this cold accretion creating a lot of really powerful shock waves, resulting in what the scientists refer to as supermassive stars. Stars more massive than anything we have in the local universe, possibly up to 100,000 solar masses, and stars that very likely existed for just a few thousand years, not even a million years, exploding as powerful supernova afterwards and seeding the galaxy with additional materials to produce new stars. Or in a nutshell, the combination of neutral gas that existed early on that prevented the formation of smaller stars early on would eventually collapse into these massive objects almost right away as soon as massive amounts of gas coming from the outside started to form various dense regions inside these new galaxies. With all of this very likely being really, really fast, lasting less than 1 million years for sure, which does present these early galaxies and early universe that's something really strange. It's this super dark, super cold gas that suddenly explodes in hundreds, thousands and millions of these fireworks almost all at once, as all of this gas starts interacting, creating over densities and produces these very massive but short-lived stars. But in this case, it could only have happened once, when there were no heavier elements around. As soon as the universe became enriched in other elements, no such massive dense clouds could ever be formed again. It was simply too hot to exist. And so it is a pretty intriguing explanation and a pretty intriguing paper that even potentially explains why we haven't really seen these stars yet. Even though they were ridiculously bright and very, very powerful, they simply existed for too short of a time for any telescope to catch them. In other words, we will have to get pretty lucky to find a galaxy where these stars are still in existence and are still producing very powerful amounts of energy and have not gone supernova yet. But because of the amount of radiation these stars are expected to produce, they should be pretty easily visible. So it's only a matter of time. Although in this case, this is still not a perfect explanation. For example, it's still unclear if the magnetic fields in this case played any role as well, or if it's something that happened right after the first supernova occurred and produced one of the first metallic elements. Today, most of these modern simulations are not complex enough to simulate powerful magnetic fields. And there's also no good explanation for what kind of an explosion we can expect from these stars either. Would these explode as very specific supernova? And would they actually leave anything behind? And are these stars also responsible for the formation of some of the more massive black holes we've detected so far? So still a lot of questions to answer. But nevertheless, a really intriguing simulation and a very intriguing explanation for the potential existence of these first stars and what these first stars might have been like. But this is not the first explanation and probably not the last either. So we'll actually be talking more about this in some of the future videos. Check out some of the previous explanations in the description below. Thank you for watching, subscribe, 
share this with someone who loves learning about space and sciences, come back tomorrow to learn something else, and maybe support this channel on Patreon by joining the channel membership or by buying a wonderful person t-shirt you can find in the description. Stay wonderful, I'll see you tomorrow, and as always, bye-bye.